Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Silver Screen Dudes. My name is Nico Luro, and this doesn't happen very often. I get starstruck. I'm with one of my favorite directors of all time today, Mr. Neil Marshall. Thank you so much for joining me here today on the channel, sir. Well, thank you. It's, uh, yeah, I'm going to try and not mince my words in, in your presence and try and keep it cool. But yeah, between The Descent, Lair, Reckoning, Dog Soldiers, which I mentioned you off camera, like I, I have loved everything you've done so far. And here we are talking about oh, Duchess. Yay. Woohoo. So, so reviews coming out uh, for Duchess this Monday, depending on when this interview releases. But when I finished watching this movie, I kind of thought this is like a perfect combination, a perfect balance of really bloody and like really charming. Was that the vibe you were going for? What, how did that inform the filming of this movie? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I just wanted to make a really solid, entertaining movie, but I guess I can't resist bringing my sort of horror sensibilities to the to to whatever I do. Um, so you know, when the blood starts flowing, it's like usually you know comes in gallons. <laughs> so uh, it really did. Yeah, but I thought, thought it also like if I'm going to delve into this world, this crime world, this gangster world, you know, it's just as gnarly as pretty much anything else out there. You know, any, any Scorsese film will, will show you that. Uh, when things get nasty, they get really nasty. So um, I wanted to keep up that tradition, you know. It's, yeah, and it's less a traditional sort of Scorsese gangster film, but I very much got a man on fire vibe with this film. Like, there's, all, there's all sorts in there. Yeah, there's definitely some Man on Fire. Um, I suppose the Scorsese thing more comes out with the voiceover mm. um, than anything. Um, and, you know, there's a bit of Guy Ritchie, but there's a bit of Long Good Friday. There's a bit of Italian Job and Sexy yeah. Beast. And, you know, there's a lot of 70s cinema being referenced in there because I love that period of, of, of cinema. And um, so, like, to even things like the titles and uh, the music... I wanted to go for a really strong 70s vibe to it. Yeah, same here. I think that's my favorite era of cinema, actually, the 70s. Um, but I want to touch on what you've said about, you know, the gangster, the, the gangster landscape within movies. So, I mean, traditionally in these in these movies, female roles in these gangster movies, especially British gangster movies, probably, mm -hmm. they've they've been quite minimalist, you know. Between your your hyper in, uh, between things like uh, think of the female role in Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels, which basically was non-existent. She was silent until she pulled out a Bren gun, right? Oh, yeah, and then you it. look at more recent things like The Gentleman or or Snatch, and it, it's very very downplayed. Like, how much of that history do you think you wanted to swap out here? Because you do have yourself a history of casting really strong, powerful female characters. Uh, well, so the, the the origins of this movie were that came out of a conversation with me and Charlotte back in 2018, where mm. we were just you know just talking about loving gangster movies and our favorite gangster movies, and um, at some point it was the idea was thrown into the mix of like, well, what about a female Scarface? Yeah, you know? uh, which is like another great gangster movie, and so that was the germ of it. Obviously, like we didn't just go out and do Scarface with a woman. It's like I wanted to come up with a story, but like. Uh, you know, an interesting, fresh take on it, but also kind of play to Charlotte's strengths. Um, you know, the character is an East End girl who makes it big. It's like, well, that's that's kind of Charlotte. So mm. <laughs> that was, you know, starting from those basics and then building it up there. Obviously, she had to learn about boxing and f firearms and other fighting and stuff like that for the film. Um, so that's not Charlotte, but the character is developed from that or, or origins. And then just taking a story and making it more, I don't know, I wanted to give it an international flavor mm. um, with the casting, with the setting, with the subject matter to make it about diamonds instead of drugs. Um, just just to, just to spice it up, just to, to come with a fresh take on things. But I, also, I definitely wanted to give it a very British sense of humor throughout. I can't, I can't resist that. Um, and then, you know, when it gets dark, it gets dark. Yeah, there, it's so much to unpack there with what you just said. Like when I saw the tiger, I was like, oh, Tony Montana's in the house, huh? Right there. <laughs> right there. I've seen that. But yeah, well, um, yeah. There's, a, there's a story behind that as well. It was like, um, it was originally written to be hyenas. It was going to be a, two oh. hyenas. Because uh, okay. it was, you know, it was going to be in Africa. It was like, you know, 
hyena country uh and we, we filmed it in tenerife and they could only get us one hyena um because cause if you put two in a, a, box, a cage together they try and kill each other apparently so uh, the male and female so we got the female and unfortunately the female was very kind of sweet natured and lethargic and really wasn't that interested in doing anything and didn't look that scary either so when we were in the edit we were like we have to replace the hyena it just doesn't work and thankfully there's a place near oxford um it's like a private zoo um this guy has lions and tigers and you name it he's got it and they're primarily used in films and for film work the lions were used for the t-rex roar in jurassic park um oh snap look at that so um so they have a tiger and we were like well a tiger is as about as cool as you get i mean if it works for tony montana we'll have a tiger so we, we literally rebuilt a section of the set in the tiger's cage and then the guy got in with his little stick <laughs> that's what he's got he's got a little stick and he gets the tiger to do all this stuff you know to camera and for stuff in the cage and it all cut in we managed to sort of blend it in seamlessly so you know there's, there's, there's the tiger doing its stuff so it's cool. impressive it's a you know magnificent animal for sure <laughs> deceptively large right like you think you oh, see them huge. on screen and then you see them and it's like oh yeah. it's not a small kitty cat it's no it's enormous. not the size of a small car you know <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah proper beast and yeah you're, you're the diamond switch as well so what, what was there any history behind making that decision because you know when we get to that that scene with uh with boss lady and you think okay it's gonna be it's gonna be a drug thing oh mm. we're talking hard rocks not soft rocks okay yeah were, is, were there movies that you've seen that made you kind of lean that way maybe or what what was the decision making behind doing diamonds instead of drugs um so the very first draft uh was about drugs it was to do with mexico you know robert was meant to have come from you know uh mexico somewhere and it was part of a cartel there it's like a front mm. for a cartel and it was going to be about drugs and i just sort of reread it and just thought this all feels so familiar i've seen it before um let's do something different and i also had a secret desire to want to go and shoot it in south africa because i've worked there several times and i absolutely love it down there um so i tried to sort of i wrote it to be set in cape town and because we're going to oh. africa i thought let's make it about the diamond trade um and i you know i've heard of quite a lot of stories about it did a lot of research met people involved in the trade got some really interesting stories from them uh, and it kind of came from there, but then, of course, at the end of the day, we didn't get to shoot it in, in Cape Town. We shot it in Tenerife, but mm. the, the the story still worked 100. percent So it was like, okay, so it was diamonds. And I thought, even obviously, there's a really dark side to the diamond trade, but I just thought diamonds in themselves is something that is very appealing to people. Mm. Um, there's something still glitzy and glamorous about diamonds. There's bling about diamonds that we don't necessarily get bling from, like a, a pile of cocaine but you get it from diamonds and you know where they end up is fascinating yeah and that that actually that whole dialogue where robert's describing like yeah they pretend they're not conflict diamonds they don't know they don't care they just want it on the customer's wrist or around their ears i thought mm -hmm. i was like yeah that that that's the first time i think since blood diamond that i've seen a movie actually address that properly which is cool to see mm -hmm. um i want to talk to you a little bit about your your the the cinematography style that you employ in your movies because it's it's purposefully quite gritty um between sort of like the descent dog soldiers this there's there's a purposefully gritty style to it i think and it's funny we talked about man on fire because tony scott's the other director r.i.p mm. who had that very gritty style like so when it comes to actually shooting these what what's the methodology behind it how do you create that look um a, a lot of it's out of choice some of it's out of necessity of um i mean i always try and make my films very cinematic no matter what you know i want mm. them to look good and they you know they they all do um and you know we filmed this one in anamorphic widescreen you know got anamorphic lenses so we make it very very cinematic but the the, the kind of the grittiness sometimes comes from like um you know we're up against it on the schedule like on one day we had a shootout to see to, to shoot and um we got like two hours left in the day to do it it's like well how are we going to do that well okay we're going to do it by um getting the cameras off the dollies and tripods sticking them on the shoulder and uh we'll have the actors essentially just run the action a number of times and you're just going to get in there with the cameras and and shoot almost documentary style like see what you mm. get you know try and get the angles try and get the shots 
uh, and we'll see what we get. And and that was like the only way to get it done in that length of time. But what you get out of that is a real energy. I mean, you know, I was very grateful and lucky to have cast that knew what they were doing. Like, so, you know, Philip Winchester, John Pertwee, they know how to, you know, Hoji Fortuna, they know how to handle weapons. And mm -hmm. so the, the, they, I'm safe to, to know that they're going to go in there, they're going to do their thing. They know exactly what they're doing. It's really just a case of getting the camera guys in there and just cap capturing it as quickly as possible. It's not always like that, but that was like one particular example. Um, but generally throughout my work, I favor that kind of a little bit more grounded, you know, raw approach to, yeah. to action and fights that things get a bit gnarly. I, I've always liked that aspect. It's rather than doing things that's very precise and very clean. I think violence isn't really like that. Uh, yeah. except in the movies it's usually quite ugly and nasty so i'd like to shoot it that way and it's correct me if i'm wrong it's now your third or fourth and lair reckoning and duchess those are the three times you've worked with charlotte right uh this is my the third it? yes yeah so w w talk to me about a day in the life of, of working together like what what's it like when you're when you're having to direct uh an actress who's who's got to do quick it's a lot as you said that was required her of this so i imagine no day was quite the same but give me give me a rundown yeah no no day is ever the same um it was it's pretty straightforward i mean uh let's say we, we this is our third time making a film together and it's it's uh once we've got through the writing process hmm. uh which we collaborate on then there comes a point at which like she just says okay to, to, from today onwards, you know, in prep order, from today onwards, I'm an actor, and that's I'll just do that, and I'm just the direct, I'm the director, and then if there's any script work still needs doing, I'll handle that from then on. Um, so there's a there's a point where she, you know, the line is drawn, and then then we go out and we make the film together, and, and you know, and, and and it works works pretty easily. Nice, um, and like a lot of the time creatives talk about people or events that have influenced their work were there were there any real life events that you have gone through that i mean that's quite a pull considering the type of movie this is i appreciate that but was there anything kind of first-hand real life experience that you slotted into the movie and thought yep that can go in there uh not really <laughs> not, not that i can think of unless it kind of came out subconsciously but no i can't think that, that there's anything in there that has happened or has been triggered by something that's happened in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and how would you say your creative process has evolved over time? So sort of from dog soldiers up to this? Um, well, I mean, it's a process that's, that started with dog soldiers is that, you know, I, I, I love to work with the actors and with the camera team and with everybody too. So I, I don't necessarily shot list stuff. You know, I'll, I'll, go in with a very open mind because uh the actors are going to bring something to the table the dp is going to bring something to the table you know if you're working with the kind of you know really cool creative people that i do and collaborate with the production designer and you know it, all these aspects come to play uh on a scene that you're directing even the weather or the location or the you know how hot or how cold whatever it is the, the, the where the sun is at that time of day makes the lighting different and you've got to be adaptable to that i think mm. once you get set in stone of shot lists and things like that you you know you need to you need to be flexible you have to be able to think on your feet um so that's not to say that once we're there and we map it all out and we block it and work out the camera angles then we'll draw up a shot that's based on what's actually in front of us as opposed to some hypothetical idea i learned that on dog soldiers very early on you know actors don't want to sit in this chair for a six page scene they want to get up and move around it's like mm. you know when i wrote it it was like well that seemed all right but in reality of course that'd be boring as fuck so uh <laughs> you know so when one actor says no no no, this is the, i want to get up and move around you're like yeah you're right of course so that whole concept that whole shot list and storyboard goes out the window so i i i do think like that there's certain scenes stunts stunt work and visual effects work where you know you 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 stick to the plan you know, you mm. have a plan, you go and sure. you stick to the plan because it's either with visual effects work, if you don't stick to the plan, it becomes very expensive. And with stunt work, if you don't stick to the plan, you know, somebody gets hurt. And, and you know, I don't want that happening on my production. So um, those are the kind of things where I stick, you're a little bit more pre-planned. 
but I do, I do, I say, I, just just to be able to think on your feet, I think that's the big thing. Yeah, great, great advice for any aspiring filmmakers out there. I have to say, when you're talking about writing scenes with people sitting around, I can I can very easily visualize in Dog Soldiers that was the scene where they explained what bone meant. Bone yeah. bollocks, not well, well, very good. Quite, there was quite a few scenes in Dog Soldiers where it seemingly people are sitting sitting around and like, well, that's not very exciting, is it? So. Nah. Yeah, we'll work I hear that. that. Um, yeah, so I don't even know where to go from here. There's so much I could ask you, and I know we've got limited time. Um, what was the most challenging part of this production, and how did you overcome it? Ultimately, the most challenging part was that um, when I went down to Tenerife, I had a, I had 32 days to shoot it, mm. and very shortly after that, it was, I was told I had to cut seven days from the budget from the schedule. Oh. So um so we still did essentially this, we, yeah, we didn't cut anything from the script we just cut it from the schedule so we had to condense the entire film into 24 days instead which was really tough and um hmm. you know but that's again that's like as a director you just gotta think on your feet how are you going to get through that you know i don't want to compromise by cutting stuff out um and then the other thing was i got covered halfway through the shoot oh, God. um so having having survived for like two years without getting it at all through all the, all the lockdowns prior and then i get it slap bang in the middle of the shoot um, um but thankfully it didn't derail the production at all we were we were shooting some stunt work and uh i just ended up directing from a tent on the other side of the set with a, little, a radio and a monitor that was it that's all i had <laughs> very cool did you have but, a second unit director to help you with that no, just uh, the, just the DP and uh, the stunt coordinator, or whatever for the for those scenes. But uh, a I, I was literally out, out of it for a day, and then I tested clear like two days later after the weekend, and it was fine. So it didn't it didn't stop us at all. But it could have. I mean, it could have done. It could have gone worse. That actually answers a lot of questions I had. I was sort of wondering about the the Tenerife part of the film because it, it felt it felt both. I guess labored and rushed. Like for example, that scene where Robert and Scarlett are looking out over over the cliff face. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure they didn't want to have a foggy day that day. And I was like, that he's clearly had his time cut here. Um Yeah, I mean that that was that was a classic example of of uh um you know, you're going to Tenerife for the beautiful weather yeah. and on the, the day we're shooting the scene in which they arrive in Tenerife where as you say, they go out into the garden and look out over the, the, the incredible view. It was a dull, foggy day, oh. and on the on our schedule, there was simply no alternative. It was like we can't we can't juggle it around. We have to do this this, this day. Um, I mean, thankfully, the visual effects guys did some miracle and put some blue in the sky and stuff like that, which helps enormously. But uh, so you've only seen that version of it. If you saw the original shot, it just looks it's just grey and horrible. You're like, oh, you got the drone and everything. You paid for all yeah. the stuff to be there. And it's like the bloody yeah. weather. <laughs> yeah. For Which real. you'd expect in the UK, but you don't expect in Tenerife. You really don't. And it's, it's, I, am I right in thinking that there was a few things where you didn't have a chance to do as many takes as you wanted? Like that death scene. Am I allowed to say that? Yeah, this will come out after embargo. That's fine. Well, it's, um, no, like it's, the, no, it's no surprise that there's going to be a death in the film somewhere. Just right, there has to be. Group. <laughs> the, but yeah, the no, that was scene, very, yeah. that was very much almost like you know we got a we got like one take at it, you know, one take. Uh, wow, 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 pretty wow. much, yeah. And that was a day when the weather flipped on us and was was unbelievably hot. It was like forty degrees in that that desert location. It was miserable. Um, so but, the actors uh, are probably relieved. <laughs> yeah. But the other, I mean, the funny thing about it is that, that that little canyon thing is right at the end of the runway, at the airport. So it was like planes flying overhead every five minutes, things like that. But it was a great location, and it gave us what we needed. Shout out to the sound engineer guys for helping that one out, then, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Um, okay, I want to touch a little bit on your history here, just because the Descent and Dog Soldiers are the two films that really brought me to to love your work and say, okay, this guy, I'm following him. The werewolf design in Dog Soldiers. Mm -hmm. How did that come up? Because I think I'll never forget. My mother said, well, it clearly looks like men in dog suits. And I went, no, it doesn't. This looks like kind of a slender man thing a la werewolf. I'm like, what was the, 
how did you come up with that design? Uh, well, I mean, you know, in, in all honesty, I didn't. Um, the first concept drawing that was ever done was by a, a, a friend of mine in Newcastle who's a sound recordist who okay. had never told me that he had secret drawing skills. But anyway, he, he did a pencil sketch or a pen sketch or whatever, a couple of different angles of this werewolf idea. Um, and it had this real elegance to it. But the, mm. the way that it, it had shape and form, it looked really elegant. And I was like, this is this is really beautiful. It's kind of terrifying and beautiful at the same time. Um, and then I took those drawings to a guy called Dave Bunnywell, who ultimately uh, rejigged the design and refined it and ended up in the, the design that we have. Um, and he worked for Bob Keane's company. And then he built uh, a beautiful like maquette. I don't know where that is. Somebody's got mm. it somewhere. It's a beautiful maquette of the werewolves. Um, and, you know, that's that's the way they're kind of evolved and then i mean the story behind them is that when once we built the, the suits um i designed them around having dancers inside of them rather than you know big burly stuntmen i wanted these elegant dancers inside them to give them that elegance to carry on with the design and the, the theme of it um but unfortunately once you put dancers on stilts and then basically make them blind because they mm. couldn't see out of the werewolf heads all that elegance went right out of the window and they were staggering around and bumping into each other and tripping up and falling over. And it's like, ah, that wasn't quite what I planned. But then later in the film, when the werewolves get into the house, yeah, they were able to kind of use the walls and the ceiling and kind of like move around on that. And then they got all their elegance back and they moved in this very graceful way. And uh, and then that made them creepy again. It was just cool. they, they really were. It was like bloody creeping dread watching them. And when it came to that script, one of the things that I thought was so funny, and I think this was on purpose, it was almost like you were toying with this notion of let's go as B-movie as possible and then whoop, bring it back in. Like that well, that line Sean Pertwee says, oh, my guts are hanging out. And what was the reply? Oh, we'll put them back in. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> and then you just nah, crank it up, crank it up, crank it up. And I said this to you off camera. I'll say it again now so it's on camera and hopefully this one stays with you. The, I think this is Seven Samurai with werewolves. It's okay, I, I'm not going to argue with that. I think it's a fantastic description for it. Yeah, it's yeah. So, so when it came to the script writing, how much of that was like written, and how, uh, or were there any parts which made it into the movie where they went a bit off script and acapella? Um, it was pretty much all on page um, that I can think of. There might have been one or two. Um, it was a long time ago, so. <laughs> uh, but I think it was pretty much all on page because I went through a lot of drafts of that script. It was like eighteen mm. drafts or something because it wow. took six. It took six years from um, writing the first draft to actually shooting it. So I had a lot of time to rewrite it and you know work on it and get all those dialogue and those little moments and layers in there. So all of that dialogue, I, as I recall, was in the script. Nice. Um, Cool. I want to move on to the descent, and then we'll bring it back to to, to Duchess. Now, again, talking about the cinematography and the descent. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wasn't aware that I had claustrophobia until I saw that film. How, how did you get those shots? Like, because I imagine some of it was on location and some of it was on set. No, it was all on set. There all is, there on is, set. Yeah, there isn't a real cave in the whole movie. Um, oh, the magic of Hollywood. Magic movies, yeah. No, it was very quickly established that if we were to try and film that in a real cave, you know, people would have got hurt. <laughs> like, it wasn't going to go well. I mean, try, going down with an expedition is one thing. Going down with a film crew, like, oh, yeah, yeah, you, know, you don't want to do that. So, uh, so no, it was all sets, but we built the sets in a way that, like, they weren't convenient. You know, they were not yeah. meant to be convenient. If it was meant to be a tight space, it was a tight space. And we didn't, like, cut them in half and, you know, build camera traps or anything like that in it. It was like, to Saint Sam, the, the the DP and and camera operator was like, well, can you get in the hole with them? You know, basically, <laughs> you got to you got to get in there. And in, in one case, it was literally like we got a plank of wood and we screwed the camera to the end of the plank of wood, oh. and like so we could slide it into the, the one of the tunnels and do a tracking shot, literally by pulling this plank of wood back out of the tunnel slowly, um, and things like that. And it worked. It was it was the way to get the camera into the holes with the with the, the cat. Um, the other thing, I mean, there's a few tricks. One of them was like filming our wide angle lenses in there that actually that was going to be my which, next question didn't, yeah. which bring the walls in they don't yep. make it feel bigger they make it feel smaller 
Mm -hmm. uh, they kind of bring the walls in around you. And um, so that kind of stuff went on. The use of the lighting as well was always the case that I, you know, I, I, me and the DP, Sam, talked about this at length years before we made it, was I want there to be like massive parts of the screen will just be black. And you'll be in the bottom left-hand corner, there's going to be a little somebody with a torch or a, a match, yep. you know, and that's what it's like being in a cave. Mm -hmm. you know? It is. And so I wanted to capture that. And I think, you know, I think we did pretty well. Well, listen, from watching that movie, I've actually gone on and become a semi-proficient um, cave cinematographer myself, like but underwater caves. And wow. and that's why I still look back on The Descent as such like a seminal moment for me personally, because it kind of led into something I do now. But it's like it even it hasn't aged because it's so accurate the way that caves just eat light. And it's mm -hmm. even more impressive when you think that this is something you did on a set. Like, how did you get it to black out like that? Uh, well, when we, sh when I mean, a lot of it's, in, in, it was quite dark on set, uh, but it wasn't entirely dark. If you were to watch the original negative or whatever, you'd probably see a lot more detail. When we went into the grading, we like crushed all the blacks. We crushed it down mm. to get rid of, you know, to make anything in shadows just look really dark. So there'd be nothing there. So, you know, a lot of that's in post. Um, but yeah, and also, you know, we were lighting it with, you know, we kept the rules, which is that the, the only light source in there was what the characters took with them. And we stuck to that rule. Yeah. Very cool. All right. Well, let's round it off then. So what, what impact do you hope that Duchess leaves on the gangster genre? Well, I mean, I just hope it's it's a worthy addition to the canon, you know? I just hope people, you know, it, it'd be nice if people are talking about it in a few years' time still, or people put it up there with other gangster movies they've enjoyed, for sure. You know, at the end of the day, I just want people to walk out uh, or, you know, finish the movie feeling better than they did when they started. <laughs> just... It did that to me, Neil, I can tell you that. Listen, but one of the things I said in my review was, for all of the naysaying that goes on on both sides when it comes to the politics of movie making, like it's too woke, it's too anti woke. There's they're pushing females to be James Bond. They want to race swap X, Y, and Z role. And I'm like, oh, there's not enough original movies being made anymore. I've just said, Duchess ticks all those boxes. You got an original script made by one of the best in the world working today. And I mean that when I say that, but I've shared that love with you already. Um, you've got a female protagonist at the center of everything who's not subservient to men and which men are not subservient to her. Mm -hmm. She hasn't, there's no race swapping. There's no identity politics. It's just fresh. And that's what I think it's biggest strength is that in a world where everyone has a freaking soapbox opinion, this yeah. movie's just come on and gone, shut up and watch me. Yeah. Well, that was the plan. Just want to make a rollicking good movie, you know? It really is. It's such fun, man. And, okay, so last thing, I promise. Um, one of two things. If you could do a Rushmore, of your Rushmore of gangster movies, what would your four be? Um, okay, Long Good Friday. Good fellas. Yeah. Um, the Untouchables. Nice. Uh, Scarface. The Godfather doesn't make the list. I love the fact that you put Scarface on there. Thank you. I get <laughs> so much grief for that on the podcast when I say to people, I prefer Scarface to Godfather. I get looked at with daggers. Well, I love the fact Godfather that... would be number five. But... <laughs> there you go. And what about your Rushmore for horror movies? Uh, for that, it's like uh, American Werewolf in London, Alien, um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre and The Fog. Oh, that's a good list. Wow. All right, Neil, where can people find you online and what's the next project that we can look forward to from you? Uh, so I'm on Instagram, uh, Neil Marshall Director, easy enough to find. And uh, next up, uh, well, say we've got Compulsion at some point. Not sure when, but it's Compulsion. hopefully we'll be hitting festivals soon. Any clues as to what that's about, or is it completely lip sealed for now? Uh, it's part erotic thriller, part giallo slasher. Charlotte Kirk in this one, uh, and Emma, uh, Anna Maria Seclica from um, uh, fuck. 
<laughs> uh, 360 days. 360 days? Yes. Yeah. We'll That's go with that. Yeah. Um, any, I promise this is the last one. Any plans to go back to horror at some point in the future? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah? I've got plans. Many plans. Love that. I can't wait. Neil, honestly, it's been such a pleasure speaking to you today. I can't thank you enough for taking no the time. You've, yeah, they say don't meet your heroes. This, that I disagree with that statement. I've loved your film since I was a kid. This is big life, life goal for me. So well, thank you for that. My pleasure. All right. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, man.